Well, amen. Amen. Always stinks to have to follow something like that, but here I am. Well, and, and it's always a joy. Well, good morning, first of all. Good morning. Um, to be in God's house as we worship and to think about the Bible and to read from the Bible. And I had a chance this week to talk to somebody who um, doesn't like parables, or at least has a hard time with the parables of Jesus, because it always seems that when Jesus is encountering a, a question from someone or needs to make a point, he tells a story. And uh, this person really wanted black and white, um, and, and I identify with that too. Just tell me what you mean. But oftentimes, Jesus tells us a story. And now, the, the scripture we're going to read today, I wouldn't say it's black and white, but I would say it gives us a pretty clear picture of what Jesus wants. So here we are reading from Luke 18 this morning. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Thieves and rogues and adulterers or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven but was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful on me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I think one of the most convicting pieces about this particular parable, this particular story of Jesus, is that when we read it, this, this, uh, these words that the Pharisee says about other people, I think that's a version of something we've probably all said or at least thought about other people. At least I'm not like other people, less holy, less righteous, less good. At least I'm not like those sinful people. At least I'm not like other people. Now, of course, Jesus in his... Uh, telling of this story senses our urge like the Pharisee to be the decider the judge the person that plays the role frankly of God and so Jesus senses that and kind of turns that script on its head maybe you've heard that Anne Lamott quote Anne Lamott is a contemporary Christian writer lots of great books Um, but she has this quote that goes like this You can safely assume that you've created God in your own image when God hates all the same people that you do. You can safely assume that you've made God look a lot like you when they don't like the same people, when God doesn't like the same people that you don't like. That's a pretty convicting statement, and I think she hits the nail on the head with that one. And I think... That's kind of what Jesus is pushing us away from. The power of humility, I think, is that it reminds us that it's those who seek to be brought low and restored that will be raised up. It's those who seek to be low that will be raised high. It's those who humble themselves that will be exalted. In order to be lifted, you got to start down here. And I think that's what Jesus is trying to say about humility. We have a lot of different ways to think about humility in our culture, certainly. Some good and some not so great. But I think one way we can start, and um, I I told our confirmands last week that that if if I ask a question and you don't know the answer, usually the answer is Jesus. And so a good place to start with how do we know what humility is, is Jesus. 
Now, I'm going to throw two Greek words at you today, so get ready for that. The first one, kenosis. Kenosis. And basically, kenosis is the idea that Jesus completely emptied himself so that he could be completely obedient to God. It's the idea in, in the incarnation when Jesus took on full humanity and full divinity in order to, to completely experience what it means to be human. And then culminating in the crucifixion where Jesus was obedient to God unto death. We get a perfect example of what it means to be humble. Perfect humility in Jesus Christ. Now I think Jesus, knowing that we couldn't all achieve this kind of uh, complete obedience and perfection, um, at least not in the same way that Jesus could, uh, gives us the story in a way to show us how to be humble. And it looks a little different. Because we can never completely follow God's will, we are invited into a kind of humility that admits our flaws, admits where we haven't gotten it right, not for the sake of self-hate, but for the sake of reorienting, reorienting ourselves towards God and saying, we can do better. We can be better. Now, before we dig into this humility thing, I think it's important to clarify what humility isn't because there's a couple um, ideas about humility floating around there that aren't quite right. The first is false humility. Maybe you know this. Um, sometimes it's when somebody has made a, and, and I think a lot of us are guilty of this, including myself, but when someone has made a sacrifice, has done something good, has done something honorable and right, but wants to make sure that everybody knows that they did that. Whether, you know, through uh, making sure that they bring it up nonchalantly in conversation or posting on Facebook or this or that. I, you know, I, I'm guilty of doing those things, of trying to seem humble, but really wanting to project how great I am. This is the Pharisaic trap, I think. And another way to think about this is the humble brag. Have you ever heard of that phrase, humble brag? Well, we were thinking about ways to, to kind of explain what a humble, gra humble brag is. And, and one way I thought was, you know, if somebody says, well, you know, this week I was only able to make it to the orphanage to be with the kids four out of five days of the week. And so, you know, I'm really not that great of a person, you know. Um, or or uh, as Pastor Tim and I were thinking about, you know, pastors are on most of the committees or one of us is on most of the committees in the church. And we were thinking about, you know, how you could say, well, I was only able to be on 13 committees this year instead of 15, you know, so I'm, I'm not all that great. It's sort of a way of, of saying you're pretty great without saying you're pretty great. This isn't quite the kind of humility that I think we're called to. And another way, another kind of humility that I don't think we're called to is the humility that is completely denying yourself and your own needs and your own relationship with God for the sake of others. And if we look at the history of our church and our society, um, Big C, the ch church all over, we see that it wasn't that long ago that women, in particular, were not given full opportunities to participate in the life of the church, to hold leadership roles, and certainly even until the last 50 or so years in this church, in the United Methodist Church or the Methodist Church, to become pastors. And yet, women were expected still to cook again and again, to care for children, to educate those children, to keep the home and the church in order, to organize events, to raise money for missions, and to give and to give and to give. But not having the opportunity for full appreciation and participation in the life of the church. Perhaps some of this still lingers, but certainly in our past, we have seen this take place. There is a history of the church, particularly of women, encouraging women to be self-emptying, to give of themselves and give, but yet not have the opportunity to be filled fully in the same way as men. I think this is maybe a dark truth. 
But this is not the kind of humility that we're talking about. Humility is not a position of emptying yourself for the sole sake of others and neglecting your own flourishing and your own um, wellness. It's being subjected and being willing to be transformed. A willingness to be brought low in order to be transformed. The second Greek word that I'm going to throw at you today is metanoia. And basically, metanoia is this idea of a spiritual conversion, a transformation, a change in your heart that makes you see differently, a conversion. Being humbled so that you might be exalted is a recognition of seeing who you could be in Christ from a different place. And it's not a process just of sorrow or regret and then seeing, oh, oh I didn't you know, realize all the harm I had done or, or who I was. It's a conversion. It's a vision of something better, of something restored. The wonder of the parable that we read today is, is, is Jesus saying it's not about how we feel about others or how we stack up. It's about our orientation towards God. The Pharisee, in the story, asks God for nothing. His prayer, so to speak, is, is about what he's done. It's saying, God, look at all I've done. But he asks God for nothing. And it was the tax collector who recognized his, how, how he had fallen short in sight of God and confessed his need for restoration. It was the tax collector who walked away made right. I've heard it said that in every good story in the Bible, there's perhaps a good car analogy to go along with it. Maybe you've heard this too, a good car analogy. Now, um, I, I know there are probably several of you in this room that are mechanically minded and probably know your way around a car. Um, I, you know, it reminds me of the one time in high school when I, I called my dad because I couldn't get my car started, and that's because I had left it in the school parking lot in neutral. Um, and, and, and I was like, I think the battery's gone out or something's, maybe the engine fell out. No, I just left it in neutral. Um, and so, you know, I'm not really of much of a car guy. And so I can't confirm whether this rumor is true. But I do know because I've watched enough of those cable shows about restoration, hardware, and uh, restoring antique things that it got me thinking about the difference between preserving and restoring. Because you see, preservation of a car is trying to keep it as is, usually referring to the outside appearance or what's called preserving patina. It usually refers to an antique car's body and, and the paint and body unrestored with a natural finish that embraces the years of wear, tear, and repair a vehicle has earned during decades of service. And so more or less, a preservation of a car, a preserved car, is a historical artifact. It's there, we, we, when we might look at it and be reminded of a time gone by. We might look at it and be reminded of all the rides it took and the places it took us and the meaning that it had for us. But we'd be lucky if it leaves the garage on anything but a tow truck. It's a reminder of what was. Restoration, on the other hand, is characterized as returning a vehicle back to its original condition or better and can be refurbished using original or reproduction parts and techniques. And some restorations can be performed with a focus to completely restore it uh, with as many original components as possible. But some restorations, you can take an old car and modernize it with an updated engine, suspension, brakes, tires, and electronics. When a car is restored, it's brought back to what it was intended to be. Sometimes with tweaks and changes to make it even better, but it's re being returned to a better state inside so that in essence, it can have a brand new life. A brand new life so too could it be for our faith. 
that we could be restored inwardly and outwardly, our guts and everything else, warts and all, could be restored so that we might have new life. What would it look like to admit our need for restoration, our need for God's mercy in whatever station we're in, whatever position in life we're at, and then to open ourselves up to being made new again? I think through the power and the practice of humility, this is what can happen. So what would that restoration look like? Well, I think as individuals, it's, it's humility, a reorientation of the self towards God and away from just ourselves to say that you're not defined by your accomplishments, you're not defined by your prowess or even your occupation. You're defined by your ability to see your own flaws, see your shortcomings, and your willingness to make them right, to be better. Restoration for you and I looks like opening ourselves to God's purifying and sanctifying grace so that all of us can be made new. Sure, the rusted out parts that clearly need replacing, but also those places in us that we might think are in good shape or, or, or things that we think that might make us holy, but really those are the very things that get in the way of us being good people. We have to be willing to subject our whole selves to the grace of God. And I think that the amazing thing that happens when we do this on a personal level is we start to see it on a communal level because we recognize that we're all kind of in this common boat of, of needing work, of needing to draw closer to God in order to be made new. And so we see how that works in community as well. Because I think in community, restoration is important too. And in order to move uh, forward in faithfulness as communities, we have to ask ourselves time and again, what are our growing edges? Where have we gone astray? What needs rebuilding? What needs retooling? And maybe what needs torn out and forgotten about? And we also ought to ask, because I think... If, if we're in need of restora restoration, that means probably along the way, someone or something has been harmed. And so we have to ask, what harm has been done by this deterioration of our spirit? Whether it's um, a person that we need to make amends with, or a group that we ought to seek forgiveness with, or a demographic of people that have been ignored throughout history, or even earth and creation itself as we think about the harm we've done to our very earth and our environment. What harm have we done and how could we make it right? This is the process of restoration. Not preserving what has always been, but seeking God to come in and restore and rebuild what is broken for the sake of new life. I believe that God desires us to admit our sinfulness and need for mercy, and clearly not for the purpose of being shamed or feeling uh, immense guilt, but for the purpose of being made new. For the sake of being made righteous and freely receiving God's grace, which is there for us to accept whether we see it or not. You see, when we preserve the norm, when we preserve our betterness, we're not only obstructing the full experience of God's grace, I think sometimes we're saying we know better than God, that we know better than God. But when we allow for restoration, we see the ways that we've caused harm. We see the ways that we've not gotten it right. We see the things that we failed to do. We see the unimportant things that we have built up and remembered and the important things that we've completely forgotten about. We do all of this work so that we could see where God intends us to be. And restoration, or sometimes called reconciliation, is exactly what Jesus did in becoming low, becoming human, becoming on the same playing field as you and I, 
in order to redeem us and restore us to new life. To be raised up because that's what Jesus did, but even Jesus himself did not do the raising. That was God's work. And so my prayer for you this day is that we can realize that our becoming holy and righteous and better is not how we stack up against others. It's not what exactly we do to be uh, set out of front and clearly be holy and righteous. It's about how willing we are to receive God's grace that will transform our lives, that will make us so we can't help but go out and do good. It's a process of being restored into the image in which we were formed, God's image. Let us pray. O oh God, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, you call us to a place of humility, not to completely lose ourselves in the mix, but rather to find our place in your midst, a place where we can receive your grace. Help us to remain humble in a way that has our arms open that we might be brought low in order to be raised up and have the glorious opportunity of restoration. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.